Take a look at this polynomial right over here. It's a polynomial in two variables, and it has this negative sign in the middle. But it turns out this polynomial is non-negative no matter what values of x and y you plug in. Let's take a look at y. So let's take a look at the first two terms, x to the fourth plus 4y to the fourth. Now there's an inequality, the arithmetic geometric mean inequality, that tells us that this is greater than or equal to twice the square root of the product of the terms. The product being x to the fourth times 4y to the fourth. So if we take the square root, this is equal to twice the quantity x squared times 2y squared, which works out to 4 times x squared times y squared. So our original expression is going to be greater than or equal to 4x squared y squared minus 4xy plus 1. And we can actually apply the arithmetic geometric mean inequality again to the first and the last term of what we have remaining to say that that's greater than or equal to twice the product, the square root of their product, which is the square root of 4x squared y squared. And then we're subtracting the 4xy, and this gives us twice 2xy minus 4xy, which actually is 0. So this expression is non-negative. But could we have certified this in a different way? In fact, we could have. Now we'll make a note that any polynomial that's non-negative, we refer to as positive semi-definite. Okay, so we'll write that down as PSD for short. But it turns out we could have shown this is non-negative by showing that it's a sum of squares of polynomials. To see that, we could subtract, we could have subtracted 4x squared y squared, and then the first two terms together with this new addition gives us a perfect square. It's the square of x squared minus 2y squared. But we can't just subtract 4x squared y squared without balancing it with adding 4x squared y squared. And together with the last two terms, this gives us another perfect square, which is the quantity 2xy minus 1, all squared. So this is a sum of squares. Okay, cool. So this expression happened to be a sum of squares. If we saw that first, that would have guaranteed it is positive semi-definite because the sum of squares is always not negative. But are all positive semi-definite things forced to be sums of squares? That's the question we're going to ask today. And we're going to look at different situations where being non-negative as a polynomial actually forces you to be a sum of squares of polynomials. Welcome to today's video on Prof. Omar. So I want to start off with polynomials in one variable and show that if a polynomial in one variable is non-negative, it's forced to be a sum of squares. So let's draw a graph of a typical polynomial like this. It might look like this. And so we can argue that p of x, whatever polynomial we have, has to have even degree if it's non-negative. Because if it had odd degree, it would go off to negative infinity as x goes to negative infinity. Okay, so since this even degree is going to go off to infinity as x goes to infinity and to negative infinity, and I claim that this function is going to be forced to have a minimum, a minimum at some value a, and let's call that minimum c. So the polynomial is greater than or equal to c, no matter what, and that a is equal to c. Now, why is it forced to have a minimum? Well, since this even degree is going to go off to infinity, so we can cut it off at certain values and then look at this interval and say by calculus that this interval is going to have a minimum somewhere. And that minimum is going to be a global minimum because the function goes off to infinity and is greater than, um, keeps going on after this interval. Okay, so we have some minimum at A, call that minimum C, and that C is greater than or equal to zero because the polynomial is non-negative. So we're going to consider a shift of this polynomial, f of x, which is p of x minus c. So since p of x is at least c for every single value of x, f of x itself is a non-negative polynomial, and it's actually 0 at a, because p of a is c. Now, f is a polynomial that's 0 at the value a, so that means that x minus a actually has to be a factor of f of x. That's the, rational, uh, the remainder theorem or the rational roots theorem. Okay, so um, we can write then f of x as 
x minus a to some power multiplied by another polynomial, q of x. All right, but f itself is non-negative, so we can actually argue that that exponent has to be even on x minus a. If it wasn't, we could pick a value very, very close to a, but just less than a, that'll force a dip into negative values. That's sort of the rough argument. So f of x is going to be x minus a to the 2k times the polynomial q of x. So if we rearrange for what the original polynomial p of x is going to be, p of x is going to be x minus a to the 2k times this q of x plus the constant c, which I'm going to write as the square root of c squared to emphasize that c is not negative and we have this as a square. So our goal is to say that p is forced to be a sum of squares. Well, let's look at the situation. We have p of x is non-negative, and we have it written as a square times the polynomial q plus another square. So that polynomial q is then forced to be non-negative. And so what we can do is apply the same process we did to p to q, which is a lower degree polynomial, and keep doing that over and over again, and then expand everything to get that p is a sum of squares of polynomials. So we're inducting and then expanding. So this is the rough sketch of why one variable polynomials that are non-negative are forced to be sum of sums of squares. Kind of a neat idea. This is not the only situation in which when you have a polynomial that's non-negative is forced to be a sum of squares. Another example is where you have an arbitrary number of variables but the polynomial has degree two. So an example is this f right here. So we're gonna use this f as motivation to get a sense of why you're forced to have this be the case. So we can write f as a matrix product with a row vector containing all the variables, the column vector containing all the variables on the right, and then a matrix right in the middle. The matrix has as its diagonal entries the coefficients of the squares of the variables. So we have one, two, and six here. And then in the corresponding other slots that need to be the case, we're gonna write down half the coefficient of the mixed terms. So for example, we have a negative one in the x, y spots, that's half of negative two, one in the y, uh, x, z spots, and three in the y, z spots. So we have this vector v containing all the variables, then this matrix m in the middle, and then a v transpose on the left. So f is non-negative, precisely when this expression v transpose mv is non-negative for all values of the vector v. So now we're going to be translating this into linear algebra. So if you don't have a familiarity with linear algebra, that's okay. Um, we're just going to give ideas of what's going on here. So this statement that v transpose mv is non-negative for all v is the same as saying that M is a positive semi-definite matrix. That's one of the definitions of being positive semi-definite. And there are other characterizations of being sem positive semi-definite. One of them is that M has non-negative eigenvalues, given that it's already symmetric. Okay, so that's gonna help us actually write F as a sum of squares if we knew that F was itself non-negative. Now, what's the idea? Well, we have that M is symmetric, so there's a way to decompose it, this is a linear algebra fact, into the product of matrices of, that look like this, Q transpose DQ. And if M has non-negative eigenvalues, then D will contain its, the eigenvalues, actually regardless of they're non-negative or not, in the diagonal, and then the diagonal entries will be non-negative, if the, non, the eigenvalues are non-negative. And here we're assuming everywhere that M is symmetric in order to have these if and only if statements. So the expression we have for F, which is V transpose MV, is now gonna look like uh, QV all transpose times this diagonal matrix D times Q times V. And that's gonna help us actually write F as a sum of squares of polynomials. To see that, if we were to expand this out, the expansion looks like the sum from i equals one to n, where n is the number of variables of lambda i, the ith entry of the diagonal d, times the ith component of the product qv times itself. When we actually expand this product here, 
So this can be rewritten. We have the ith component of QV all squared. Now QV is a matrix with contents times this vector V that contains the variables in it. So it's a polynomial in our variables, actually a linear one, all squared. And the lambda i's are non-negative, so we can write them as the square root of lambda i all squared and absorb the lambda i into the QV to get that this is actually a sum of squares of polynomials. So this is kind of a cool idea, um, and at face value is abstract, and if you don't have linear algebra experience, it seems really complicated and weird. But the point here is that if you have non-negative eigenvalues for that M matrix, then your function is going to be definitely a sum of squares. So let's apply this to an interesting problem on the International Math Olympiad. Um, it says, let's say you have n variables, and you write down this function right over here, which is a polynomial. For what values of n is this thing forced to be non-negative? And it turns out the values of n are n equals 3 and 5. So I'll let you think about all values except for the values, the value 3 itself. And I just want to look at when n is 3 and use what we did before to actually give a nice quick proof that this thing is non-negative for n equals 3. So here we're writing down the actual sum. We get x1 minus x2 times x1 minus x3, and then adding x2 minus x1 times x2 minus x3, etc. Now let's look at the expansion. So first of all, we have the square of each of the variables appearing exactly once. So we get x1 squared plus x2 squared plus x3 squared. Now let's look at the cross terms. So let's say, for example, x1, x2. We have a negative x1, x2 from the first product, another negative, but then we have a positive from the last one, so we get a total of negative x1, x2. And then by the symmetry of the variables, we get a negative x1, x3, and a negative x2, x3. So the question is, is this thing right here non-negative? Now there are many ways to do this. You can actually maybe find a quick way to write this as some sum of squares, or use some general inequalities to prove this, but I want to use the thing that we had before to get a sense of what uh, how it can be used. So we'll write this as a product of a vector containing the variables, on the left the row vector, on the right a column vector, and then in the middle we'll have this matrix. So it has ones on the diagonal and then half the coefficients of the cross terms everywhere else. Now if this thing has non-negative eigenvalues, then this is a sum of squares. And if you have even one negative eigenvalue, it's not. So um, if we go ahead and computed the eigenvalues, it turns out the eigenvalues of this matrix are 0, 3 halves, and 3 halves with multiplicity. So again, we can write this as Q transpose times this matrix here times Q. And because the eigenvalues are these values 0, 3 halves, and 3 halves, which are non-negative, we can actually write this as the sum of squares and do it explicitly. If we find this matrix Q, is going to look like 0 times the first component of qx squared plus 3 halves times the second component of qx squared plus 3 halves times the third component of qx all squared. Cool, so a nice systematic way. And we could find those eigenvalues actually by using the matrix determinant lemma. If you want to see a video on that, um, because of the way this matrix is uh, formed, where we have the same number on the diagonal and the same number everywhere else, is a really nice way to find those eigenvalues. We can actually find that this is the sum of squares in a different way, so I want to actually just show this for fun. If you factor out a half, you can write this as 2x1 squared plus 2x2 squared plus 2x3 squared minus twice these cross terms, and then now we can actually pair these things in a nice way. For example, we can take one of the x1 squareds, one of the x2 squareds, and pair it with the minus 2x1, x2 to get x1 minus x2 all squared. Okay, that leaves us with still the x1 squared and an x2 squared left over, so we can use those with the x3 squared, two copies of those, to get an additional x1 minus x3 squared and an x2 minus x3 squared. Cool. So an interesting example of using that matrix decomposition, but we could have seen this a different way. Now at this point you might be thinking any function that's non-negative, polynomial that is, that's non-negative in any number of variables is forced to be a sum of squares, but it turns out to not be the case. And this is a great example called the Motskin polynomial. So we'll use 
the arithmetic geometric mean inequality on these three underlying terms to show that this function actually is not negative. So the sum of these terms is greater than or equal to three times the cube root of the product because we have three terms involved. Now, the product of the terms is x to the sixth y to the sixth. So this is equal to three times x squared y squared. And so this expression is greater than or equal to three x y squared x squared y squared minus 3x squared y squared, which is 0. And so it's definitely non-negative. Now, this is really interesting. Um, it's a polynomial that we see that's non-negative. It was established by Moskin in, 19, in the 1960s, and it was actually not known that there was an explicit polynomial that's non-negative, but not a sum of squares. Hilbert proved in the 1800s that so there must be some example, but no example was constructed until the 1960s. To see that this is not a sum of squares, let's say we wrote it as a sum of squares. You can argue that because of the terms that appear in the expression, it must be the case that as a sum of squares of polynomials whose individual terms look like x squared y, whose squared is x to the fourth y squared, and xy squared, whose square appears in the Moskin polynomial as well, and then the xy, and then a constant term. Now leave in the comments why you can't have other cross terms inside of these things. Make an argument for all of us to see why you can assume there isn't something like a x squared y squared term inside of one of these things. Now if we compare the coefficients expanding, the sum of the squares of the ai's is forced to be 1, and the sum of the squares of the bi's is forced to be 1, because they're the coefficients of x to the fourth y squared and x squared y to the fourth, respectively. Now, the coefficient of x squared y squared, then, is going to be the sum of the squares of the ci's. But then that would be forced to be this negative 3 right over here, uh, which it can't be, because the sum of the squares of these coefficients, they're real coefficients, so there's no way this is going to be a negative 3. So it's not the case that polynomials that are non-negative are forced to be sums of squares. And there's a whole area of research, actually something that I investigated in my PhD thesis, all about this question of what the difference between non-negative polynomials and sums of squares are in general. But at least in this video, we got a sense of the fact that there is a difference and saw when there isn't a difference and why.